Well, thanks, Matt, uh, for uh, both the introduction and uh, opportunity to, uh, to present. I'll watch that little thing. Um, and there's been um, um, a couple of presentations that have already hit on uh, a couple of the projects that uh, have been uh, sort of stemmed from uh, consortium activities. Um, but we thought it would be a, a, a good opportunity to highlight some of the uh, uh, current projects that uh, haven't been discussed today um, and also make you aware of at least two new projects that are coming down the pipe um, that have uh, uh, consortium ties. And I think uh, as, as we think back to um, um, the beginning of, of the Beef Cattle Evaluation Consortium, um, a, a lot of initial effort in terms of stabilization of genetic evaluation programs across the country and, and uh, um, some internal research. Um, but I think in, in its sort of uh, culmination, um, maybe the biggest single success that the consortium can point to is the set of grants um, and the projects that have stemmed um, from consortium activities. You'll see in a little bit the, um, um, I kind of think of it in terms of return on investment. Um, if you think about over the years, uh, um, the investment in the consortium, um, probably John Pollock, you probably know the number exactly, um, somewhere in the range of what, about two and a half million dollars over about seven or eight years. Um, my last tally, and granted it's a little bit of a rough tally, just the projects that I'm gonna talk about today, uh, about 18 million dollars in funding. Um, so a pretty substantial, um, if we think about uh, the, the value of uh, research generated through consortium activity is, is pretty high. Um, and I think as we look at, at the projects that have been undertaken, um, they clearly require significant investment um, to achieve their outcomes. Um, uh, projects that are of the scale um, that um, um, previously nobody's been able to undertake. So um, I think um, um, a lot of credit goes to the vision of the original group that put the uh, consortium idea together and certainly the leadership over the years um, to motivate um, this what I call um, sort of grant pipeline um, to, uh, to be developed and really leverage um, those resources. So um, uh, just a quick review, uh, two of the um, um, uh, NBC EC um, uh, objectives uh, um, that I pulled out, there's, there's others listed in, in a couple of documents and on the web for the consortium, um, but the two that are really relevant to today's discussion are prioritization and coordination of beef cattle genetic evaluations. Um, obviously a pretty important one for our business, um, particularly as we think about um, um, the new genomics tools that are being developed and integrated into our genetic evaluation systems. And then identification of new traits and technologies that foster reductions uh, in unit cost of production um, or, and or supply consumers uh, with high value, healthy and affordable protein sources. Um, so these really capture um, some pretty grand ideas um, uh, for our industry um, and certainly uh, some of the research objectives that have uh, um, been uh, tackled that we'll highlight here in just a minute. Um, but these uh, objectives really identify the needs then to leverage um, uh, the NBCEC funding stream. Um, so how do we amplify um, that funding stream to, uh, to benefit genetic research and genetic selection in our business? And uh, maybe more importantly, how do we engage these collaborating scientists, seed stock and commercial beef producers and breed associations and other stakeholders um, to work collaboratively um, to tackle some of the very important and pressing problems our industry faces um, that can be uh, um, solved, at least in part, um, through selection. And so um, um, the goal then is to recruit this external funding and some of it's been from uh, uh, government granting sources, some of it's been from, uh, from industry. Um, but we want to capture these dollars to enable this research um, and the tactics that we're using this pipeline generally include sort of this this process or what I call the pipeline and it starts off uh, many of you have attended um, um, our December um, uh, uh, symposium meetings held typically in Kansas City or Denver um, that surround uh, a, a particular topic and we'll spend a couple of days um, sort of fleshing out ideas uh, from a number of speakers um, from both within the beef industry and other segments of uh, um, academia and uh, protein production. Um, uh, the most uh, sort of notable ones, there's been one on, on healthfulness, there's been one on feed efficiency, um, adaptation, um, and others. Um, but this sort of, at least in my idea, kind of kicks off um, our group's thinking um, on a particular topic. And then after that, there's identification um, of a project director and team that sort of synthesizes the outcome of, of that um, uh, meeting um, into uh, a tangible grant proposal um, that's targeted to a specific funding source. 
And um, um, this process, um, um, I think, has been nothing short of extraordinarily successful. Um, I think one of the, 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 the real um, pinnacle successes of, uh, of the consortium has been this process um, and the number of grants. Um, I count up about 10 projects um, that have been funded um, in excess of about $18 million of, fu of research funds um, uh, contributed so far. And a number of these projects are still in process. Um, but I think a, a really important contribution uh, the consortium's made. Um, so I want to just spend a few minutes, and, and there's a lot of text on these. Most of it's summarized. If you picked up your little white papers outside, um, I'm not going to go through all this detail. Mostly it's to keep me on track. Um, but to highlight these projects and, uh, and draw some of the connections between some of the principal scientists involved in, in the consortium and uh, the impact that's had in gathering other resources at various universities around the country um, and other scientists and certainly uh, stakeholders and producers like yourselves um, to become involved in these really important pro projects. Um, so the first one um, we're going to talk about uh, real quickly is uh, identification of molecular markers um, to improve fertility in beef cattle. Um, and Tara made mention of Milt Thomas's project. This is Milt Thomas's project and has had uh, some significant implications, not only for outcomes of his research, but also um, generation of resource populations for subsequent work um, here at Clay Center and other places. Uh, Milt Thomas is the project director. Um, I've just put the last names of uh, uh, research team members, um, Reese, Fernando, Pollock, Peters, and Webbers. Um, uh, these um, two guys are also at Iowa State. Um, uh, Sunday Peters is a graduate student of, of Meltz that's now going to work on, a, I think, a postdoc at Cornell. Um, but the objectives were um, uh, pretty broad and, and to develop a better understanding of genetic mechanisms that affect puberty, um, heifer pregnancy, and first calf rebreeding re um, in, in several breeds um, and had some Bos indicus influence represented in those populations. Um, used a, a, variety, a wide variety of uh, uh, genomics and genetics approaches, including some SNP50 data and um, um, collected up more than 10,000 um, DNA samples and phenotypic records um, on fertility, recognizing um, early on that for traits of low heritability, we were gonna need massive data sets to tackle that problem, and certainly Milt um, went after those and built a, a pretty massive data set. Um, it is a USDA AFRI-funded uh, project, um, and uh, to date has identified a couple of uh, candidate genes associated with differences in rebreeding uh, rate and calving interval um, in, uh, in heifers. Um, identified about uh, 140 um, significant uh, regions of uh, the genome for growth traits um, and 20 to 30 new QTL for fertility traits. Um, and most of the QTL for both the growth and, and fertility um, are new discoveries. And they're also undertaking some uh, gene network analysis um, that reaffirms the, the um, sort of many of us as producers understand that, you know, if a heifer is not of an adequate weight, she's not going to reach puberty. Um, and they've sort of delved into that um, um, belief um, in a scientific way um, to understand that there's a number of genes that are very important in regulation of growth that are tightly linked with regulation of puberty. Um, not a big surprise to any of us, but now we've got some genomic evidence to support that idea. Okay, um, next project's a new one, um, uh, just recently awarded uh, National Program for Genetic Improvement and Feed Efficiency in Beef Cattle. Um, there was a, a call for a, a number of grants um, uh, two years ago um, through a, a new model of funding at uh, USDA. And uh, um, I know of at least four beef um, feed efficiency proposals that were submitted in this same um, uh, request for uh, proposals. This is the one that happened to get funded. Uh, many of them featured um, a crossover of scientists and ideas. Um, and uh, certainly um, um, some of these won't be um, that novel across those projects, but this happened to be the one that got funded. Uh, but the goals were sus to sustainably reduce feed resources required to produce beef, i.e. improve efficiency. Um, via the development and deployment of novel nutritional, genomic, and genetic improvement technology. So a, a real broad range of um, tactics applied in this particular grant uh, uh, are planned. It's an integrated project. Um, um, Matt Spangler and I and Dan Loy serve on, on uh, both the research and extension teams, but there's a large extension component in this project. About a third of the funds have to be used for extension programming, and so you'll learn more about this project um, over the next few days and certainly the next few years. Um, but uh, additional goals, increase food production, sort of a, a global um, uh, issue, um, but really targeted at doing that through the improvement of efficiency. Um, the um, uh, list of uh, um, project teams spans 
I don't remember, I counted up at one point, I think there's eight or nine universities represented, um, Meat Animal Research Center, um, so a pretty broad um, um, group of scientists involved in this project. Um, resources, um, um, so far there's eight breeds committed, um, we're targeting about 8,000 animals uh, for genotyping. Um, a number of these animals um, came through relationships in the project, so they're not new animals to be genotyped, only about 24 or 2,500 animals will be new genotypes. So um, we've acquired a large portion of the existing samples that uh, exist in our business uh, for feed intake. Um, but uh, we'll add some to that, uh, targeting using some of the new high density, um, I thought the old stuff was high density, but the new high density stuff. Um, so the 770 platforms and some focus on not only marker assisted selection, but also marker assisted management. How do we transfer this technology um, into uh, uh, methods to improve feed efficiency um, and management of animals um, through the production chain? Um, it's awarded about a $5 million grant, um, just started here um, uh, two or three months ago. Um, real quickly here, uh, another project, uh, consortium involvement, uh, genetics of feedlot cattle health. Um, again, it initiated through this sort of pipeline idea. Mark ends at CSU as the project director. Um, a, a team, uh, I think four or five universities represented um, in that research team. And the, and the goals were really to take a, a first stab at understanding um, uh, bovine respiratory disease complex um, from a genetics perspective. Um, had about, um, um, well, I'll get to the, the materials here in just a second, uh, but develop methods for identifying animals that are genetically superior for feedlot health characteristics. Um, and one of the key things was to identify what other traits might contribute to um, either healthfulness of animals in the feed yard or um, in, in the way of maybe stress um, uh, measures might contribute to disease in the feed yard, okay? Um, so some of the um, um, resources, about 2,900 steers fed um, over two years um, at Lamar. Um, extensively phenotyped for the typical growth and carcass um, parameters during the feeding phase, um, included ultrasound traits, but we measured temperament and also lung lesion scores um, through the packing plant. Um, collected a huge array of blood samples on those animals for a variety of uh, uh, analysis for metabolites um, related to stress such as cortisol and uh, um, also have detailed treatment and necropsy. Um, uh, data to use um, in a number of those uh, analyses. Um, some of the findings to date, and we continue to work, there's a huge data set and we continue to work through it, but uh, one of the ones is that the probability of uh, an animal getting um, BRD, or, yeah, BRDC um, is about 0.17, um, so uh, a pretty um, sort of low to moderate kind of, uh, of heritability, but certainly one um, that suggests there's some opportunities for selection to improve that um, um, trait. Um, and the probability the animal is treated for any disease, so we have enough treatment records, we have foot rot, bloat, we've got everything the animals were treated for. Um, those had heritabilities of about 0.24, suggesting there's a number of other ailments, and certainly some of these are contributory to um, BRDC. If you think about um, animals that died from bloat in the feed yard typically had an incidence and had been treated for BRDC. Um, and so there's some uh, sort of contributing factors um, in, in those animals. And a number of these analyses, as I mentioned, are pending. Um, um, I think in, in a lot of ways um, some of the successes and certainly some of the failures of the first project led to um, this next project um, which is a much larger one and um, um, just recently awarded um, and it's an integrated program for reducing bovine respiratory disease in beef and dairy cattle. Um, Jim Womax, the, the project director, but uh, two, two really important people to point out in this, um, Allison uh, Vanny Neenemans right here. Uh, Mark Enns, who was on the previous um, grant, is right here. Jerry Taylor on the feed efficiency grant is right there. And then maybe one of the most important people on this grant, Holly Nyberg, she actually wrote the grant um, and is uh, generally, I think, recognized as the architect of the project. Fair enough, Allison? Yeah, and I know Allison had a big role in that as well. Um, but a huge project um, to uh, uh, take a bigger look at um, um, BRDC in beef and dairy cattle. Um, and certainly one that you guys recognize as producers has a huge economic impact on our business. Um, it's a, a $9 million project just awarded here in April. 
um, but um, uses a variety of tactics on the genomic side as well as um, I think you guys are actually going to challenge animals with um, uh, pathogen. Um, one of the, the big uh, obstacles in, in BRDC is that it's a, a multi-pathogen um, complex and so really having a better understanding of the progression of that disease um, and, and particularly the response of uh, immunity uh, or immune response um, should help improve our uh, ability to improve that genetically. Um, in the interest of time, I'm going to go quickly here. Um, utilization of uh, natural genomic variation to enhance nutritional and health values of beef. This is more shortly or abbreviatedly known as the Healthfulness Project. Um, one, uh, Jim Reese at uh, Iowa State's project director. Again, a big list of um, um, uh, scientists as, as the research team, including a number of uh, meat scientists from uh, uh, Oklahoma State. Um, but the goals and objectives really are to understand um, the underlying genetic mechanisms that control um, uh, fatty acid and mineral composition in beef with the idea that maybe we can select for a more healthful product um, by changing the fatty acid profile potentially um, and uh, mineral content of, uh, of that project or product. And uh, resources, they've collected about 4, 000, more than 4,000 samples. I know J.R. Tate's involved in this project. JR's here. So if anybody has some, some real pressing in questions on this one, um, he might be able to, uh, to help us out. Um, but um, um, phenotypes measured with the typical um, carcass and, and palatability, taste panel data, um, tenderness traits, um, but also included, um, uh, I think if I remember right, JR, nine different minerals um, were measured, and then uh, fatty acid profiles. And uh, um, in, um, um, I, I dug around, and I know there's a paper out that says, talks about the heritabilities of each of those fatty acid profiles, um, uh, or the concentration of those fatty acids and mineral composition. Um, but uh, found, uh, and thanks JR for sending this stuff, um, uh, a SNP marker analysis using 50K data, um, counted for between 20 and 50%. And I can, can remember JR in, in the paper, I didn't discern if it was phenotypic variants explained or of the genetic variants. It's a phenotypic, okay, so I'm, I got it typed in right. Um, so it explains a pretty large amount of the variation um, in, uh, in the carcass traits as we might expect. Um, but as we go and look at the uh, mineral composition, um, really only iron was the, the only one that the marker panel explained a lot of the uh, phenotypic variation in, not much variation in, in the other minerals. Um, but the panel was pretty successful in explaining about 44% of the phenotypic variants. And I think um, also pretty interesting is, is looking at the proportion of variation explained um, for differences in uh, fatty acid profile. Um, in particular, um, uh, meristic um, is one of the ones that's associated with heart disease in humans. Um, uh, we can potentially select against that. Um, but for traits, um, or fatty acids that are generally viewed as sort of the healthy fatty acids, um, the panel didn't describe very much variation in, in those traits. Um, and so um, this may, may tell us um, that if we want to change that, we have to do it through nutritional supplementation or other strategies to improve um, CLA content in beef, which I think this is a really important outcome from that research. Um, and also the variation in, in saturated, monounsaturated, polyunsaturated fats and the proportions of those. Um, certainly polyunsaturates are viewed as more healthful than uh, unsaturated fats. Um, and the panel accounted between a third and, and close to 50% of the variation in those traits. So I think, think some really um, interesting outcomes about our product um, and how we might select to improve um, and maybe channel and brand um, different products um, in, our, in our production chain. So with that, I'm going to stop, and uh, I think I actually got within my 20 minutes, Spangler. So shave a few off. Uh, be glad to, I'm, I'm on a couple of these grants so I can answer some questions, but uh, certainly there's others in the audience. Allison and JR may call on you um, if there's some specific questions on, on pending projects. So anybody have any questions? <laughs>